All right, let's continue with the French Revolution. This is section three, the radical days of the revolution. And as we talked about, this is the time where things get kind of crazy. So let's walk through it. Our objectives in this section. First, we'll talk about how and why the radicals in control of the national legislature, which had been, remember, the National Assembly, uh, decided to take it one step further and abolish the monarchy. We'll look at why the very inappropriately named Committee for Public Safety was created and the result of that, that being the reign of terror. After this, we'll look at how there is a reaction to the chaos of the reign of terror, sort of a pullback, if you will, uh, of the National Convention, which led to the formation of another government, this being the Directory. And we'll step back a bit and look at what the impact of the French Revolution has been on the French people, uh, what changes have happened to this point in the revolution. So a lot to cover in this section. Our focus question, what events occurred during the radical phase of the French Revolution? And as we said, there's a lot to keep track of here, so we'll take it step by step. Initially in this period, the monarchy was abolished, uh, and we took it one step further as many groups were seeking uh, establishing a republic. Outside of France, the war continued basically with France against most of Europe, uh, most of those monarchs or monarchies of Europe. After radicals gained control of the government, those who were against the revolution, uh, even perceived to be against the revolution, uh, were likely to be arrested, and many of those were subsequently executed, including Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette. Thousands of these were these who were those who were arrested uh, were sent to their death via the guillotine. All right, so let's take this step by step. 1792, the war outside of France was going very badly for, outside of France was going very badly for the French. Um, recruits, new recruits in the French army were being slaughtered by the professional troops uh, of Prussia. Many of the leaders in the French military were loyal to the king, so they were royalists. And many of these folks were deserting uh, hoping to side with those other powers to maybe come back and restore the French monarchy. Now, many revolutionaries back in France believed that the king was actively working with those other European powers to restore uh, the full power of his monarchy or retain his power. Now, we don't know for certain how the extent of which Louis XVI was, but you can certainly presume that he was not in favor of the direction that things were going and he was at least complicit in any kind of actions that might be taken to hold on to his power. In August of 1792, a crowd of Parisians stormed the palace. They slaughtered the guards of the king. The royal family was able to escape to the legislative assembly. Now remember, this is after the march to Versailles and the king and queen and family were basically forced to march back to Paris. So they were basically prisoners in the palace. So when the uh, Parisians attack the palace, uh, they are really desperate to, to find a safe place. So they go to the legislative assembly. A month later, another group of Parisians attack the prisons in Paris. Now in these prisons, we've got nobles who are being held. We've also got priests who were being held, perceived to be against the revolution. In total, about 1,200 of these prisoners, including some just common prisoners, uh, were killed in the attacks. Violence is spreading, as you can imagine, throughout Paris. In the government, radicals, the Jacobins and others, take control of what we have deemed the Legislative Assembly, and they want to take it one step further. They call for the election of a new legislative body. So we have a transition from the Legislative Assembly to our next government, which is the National Convention. And this is where things get a little more crazy. 
The new government, the National Convention, extends voting or suffrage to all male citizens, regardless of economic status, regardless of whether they own property or not. The National Convention also takes action to seize the lands of the nobles. You can imagine this might encourage many more nobles to become emigres and flee the country. Again, fanning those flames outside of France for what's happening inside of France. And perhaps most importantly, the National Convention votes to abolish the monarchy, to create a republic. So we don't need a king anymore. And if you don't need a king anymore, it makes it much easier to put the current king or the past king, Louis XVI, on trial as a traitor to the revolution, as a traitor to France. And again, remember, since he tried to escape, he's been kind of cast in that light as being against the revolution. So Louis XVI is convicted uh, by a close vote and sentenced to die. January 1793, Louis XVI is executed by the guillotine. Nine months later, his wife Marie Antoinette in October is executed via the guillotine. So let's pause for a moment. We're in 1793 and let's take a look at what's going on inside and outside of France. The country is plagued by internal and external enemies. Outside of France, the war is not going well at all. Uh, continuing to fight the Netherlands, Spain, Britain, and Prussia, again, monarchies outside of France, uh, who are intent on crushing the spread of the revolution. They don't want this revolutionary fervor to in infect or impact their monarchies, so they want to keep it and, and crush it if they can. Groups within France that support the monarchy, again called royalists, are leading rebellions against the government, so fighting against the government within France. Our group of radicals in the cities, so remember the poor urban workers, the sans culottes, uh, without breaches, uh, they're looking at more basic needs. They're looking for food because they're starving. They're looking for some relief from the rising prices that they're having to pay. So they're looking at things more in a basic human needs kind of sense. Certainly they're not, they weren't thinking that the monarchy was getting this for them, but they're, they're not content with the pace of change that's addressing those immediate needs that they have. The National Convention is divided even within itself. Uh, we have that radical group from the middle class, the Jacobins, uh, struggling for power with a more moderate group, the Girondins. So even within the National Convention, uh, there's a bit of a power struggle. In the larger sense, the French public was frustrated that all these promises of the revolution, including those more specific immediate needs that were promised, are not happening, are not coming to fruition. So we've got problems outside of France, we've got problems inside of France, both within the government and within the public. It's a chaotic situation. So into this mess, we have a proposed solution. 1793, the National Convention creates what's called the Committee of Public Safety to deal with these issues, both internal and external. Now, the Committee of Public Safety is given absolute power to deal with these internal and external issues. And again, you'll see the irony here as it, it's an interesting name for this group, but the intention again was to give them whatever the power to do whatever they had to do to resolve the situation. So the 12 member national committee, one of the first things they do is levy a tax on all the citizens uh, to help finance the war, to contribute to the war effort. And in, in, a, in a push of revolutionary fervor, we start to see some progress. We have young officers trying some different tactics, uh, starting to have some success. We'll talk in more detail about uh, who those folks are. 
but uh, some success against the Netherlands uh, and also in invading Italy. So maybe the tide's starting to turn a little bit outside of France. Inside France, the committee uh, begins to battle those that are against the revolution uh, through intimidation, through the use of fear, the use of terror. The leader of the Committee of Public Safety is Maximilien Robespierre. Now, Robespierre believed in a lot of the ideals of the revolution. He was considered a reformer, uh, but he also supported, unfortunate for many, uh, using terror as a weapon, as a tool to enforce those ideas of the revolution and to maintain order. So in general, Robespierre supported religious tolerance. He tried to abolish slavery, but he arrested anyone who threatened or was perceived to threaten the revolution. During this time, the reign of terror, more than 300,000 people were arrested and thrown into prison. At least 17,000 of these people were executed by the guillotine for opposing the revolution. Now, this period, the reign of terror continues until in the chaos, Robespierre himself is caught up and he himself is executed via the guillotine in 1794. Now, I want us to look for a moment at this political cartoon from the time. You see at the bottom it says the radicals arms. And as you move up, you see at the bottom of the frame looks to be some remnants, maybe some, some priests. We have um, some goblets there, some crosses, looks like a book, maybe some uh, papal crowns. You might you see some a sword down there. You also see it some other fancy hats that might be from the nobility. As you move up, you see a man and a woman, and they look to be very disheveled, but certainly kind of happy, maybe drunken, uh, looking a little crazy. One has a knife. Uh, they're, they're both holding uh, either glass or a bottle. Uh, it just looks a little crazy. This is the characterization of this period. So this, this is likely a political cartoon uh, that was published outside. My guess is it was probably in Great Britain since it's in English, uh, but this was the external view of the revolution. And again, you look at the center there and you see the world, the globe in flames. And this was, this was the attitude of the craziness that was happening inside of France. And we'll talk about you know, how accurate this might be here in a second. Now the guillotine itself, it wasn't, necess it wasn't invented by Dr. Guillotin but uh, it was named after him. And interestingly enough, Dr. Guillotine was not in favor of the death penalty, but he kind of justified uh, this by the sense that if we're gonna have a death penalty, shouldn't it be a more humane way to die? Now that sounds kind of cra crazy, but this form of execution at the time at least for a beheading was considered more humane. Prior to this, uh, even as we saw in Lady Jane, beheading was done by an ax or a sword, and oftentimes one strike of the blade wasn't enough, so it would be multiple times, and as you can imagine, uh, that would be a horrific experience. Now the guillotine, with its sharp blade, one cut uh, would be all it took uh, to behead someone. The first execution in France, April 25, 1792, a lot of these executions were done on a very large scale. They were very public. The quote from Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities reads, Along the Paris streets the death carts rumble, hollow and harsh. Six tumbrils, which were carts that carried condemned persons to the guillotine, carry the day's wine to the guillotine. So in a macabre kind of way, executions in the public square were entertainment. People brought uh, wine to consume and they made it into a big party so it, it, it's very disturbing the sort of the crowd reaction to this thousands are executed by the guillotine as we mentioned seven thousand often on little or no grounds uh, there sometimes all it took was mere suspicion of being against the revolution for you to be swept up 
in the fervor. So after the reign of terror, there's a reaction to this overreach, if you will. Uh, there are moderates in the National Convention uh, who are able to consolidate their power and come up with a new constitution in 1795 that sets up yet another type of government. And this government is called the Directory, and it has a two-house legislature, so two legislative bodies. Now, the members of this legislature are going to be elected by those male citizens with property. So we've got something of a step back. Not all males. In this case, they had to have property. And the directory is going to hold power in this period of the French Revolution, 1795 to 1799. Some of the actions of the directory. They're able to negotiate a peace with two of the European powers, Prussia and Spain, going to continue to fight with Austria and Great Britain. We take another step back and we create a constitutional monarchy. So we're going to establish a king, but again, it's a limited monarchy, a constitutional monarchy. So it's not supposed to be a king with absolute power. Uh, the legislature is going to be where the power lies. Now the directory had its own problems and its own level of corruption among its members. Uh, it is unable to resolve a lot of the basic need problems of the people, uh, rising bread prices, inflation, and the like. As the leader to rule France, the directory selects Napoleon Bonaparte, one of those young military heroes who turned the tide in the battles France is having with other European powers. Uh, they pick Napoleon for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's been successful militarily, so there's, pop, there's significant popular support for him to be the leader. Number two, they felt that they would be able to control him, that they would be able to do what they wanted to do without much pushback from Napoleon. As we'll see, this turns out to be a critical mistake on the part of the members of the directory. Well, let's pause for a moment and look at the end of this period, 1799. France has changed significantly from the country of Louis XVI and his court. We're applying the term citizen to all people all social classes in France, not just members of the first or second estate. So we've extended that to all the social classes. Culturally, fashions have changed. What had been the fancy and the frilly uh, is becoming more basic and practical. So think about the pantaloons that the sans culottes were wearing. Much more simple, much more utilitarian. Despite all this craziness that we've seen happening in France, we have a sense of nationalism or pride in the country among Fran the people of France. Uh, nationalism is a concept that we'll see from this point forward, uh, and it's going to be a significant, uh, a significant power, as a significant movement, but we see this in France. It's pride in your country and a willingness to defend this country, uh, both internally and externally. Remember, the government of France took over the property and the power of the Catholic Church in France. So we see a movement to have state-sponsored schools, not necessarily so many religious-sponsored schools. So state education is going to see its rise during this French Revolution. We're also going to see something of a social safety net established through the French Revolution, where there are systems or there are processes to help those that need help, whether it's the poor, whether it's the veterans coming back from all the fighting, uh, whether it's the widows of those soldiers who have died. So a social safety net coming out of a growth of, sorry, an outgrowth of the French Revolution. All right, a quick review of our key terms from this section. Some of these are repeats, uh, some of these uh, we just want to make sure we understand. So suffrage is the right to vote. 
And at one point here in the French Revolution, remember, we had all male citizens with suffrage, but then we see a step back with the directory where it's just men of property. Maximilien Robespierre, the leader of the Committee of Public Safety, the chief architect of the Reign of Terror, and remember, he himself gets caught up in the wave and he gets executed in 1794. That reign of terror, the period 1793 to July 1794, where anyone who resists or even is suspected of resisting the revolution is arrested and executed. The guillotine, the bladed execution device used during the French Revolution to behead approximately 17,000 people suspected of being against the revolution. Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, popular military hero, becomes the ruler of France, uh, selected by the Directory. And we'll talk about Napoleon and his rise and fall in the next section. Nationalism, so this pride in country, this devotion to one's country, and the extension, the willingness to defend this country. Marseille uh, is a port city in France. It's just briefly mentioned in the book. Uh, the French national anthem is named after this French city. All right, so that is the craziness of the reign of terror period in the French Revolution. We'll continue next with the age of Napoleon.